welcome to episode seven of Napaba Coffee House, hosted by Lawrence Tu. Our host, Larry, is an experienced C-suite executive whose former roles include serving as the chief legal officer or general counsel for CBS Corporation, Dell, and NBC Universal. My name is Genevieve Fantono. I'm in the Harvard Law School class of 2022, and I'm producing Napaba Coffee House as part of my student fellowship project with the Harvard Law School Center on the Legal Profession. Today's guest is Sandra Leung, General Counsel for the Bristol Myers Squibb Company, a global biopharmaceutical company. What I loved about this interview is that you really get the sense that Sandy is someone who pushes boundaries and breaks barriers. Uh, for example, when Sandy graduated from law school in 1984, her first job was to be an assistant district attorney. She was actually the Manhattan DA's office first female Asian lawyer. Now imagine graduating from law school and your first job out of the gate already shatters the ceiling. And as you listen to this interview and you hear about Sandy's career path as she progressed from being a litigator to a general counsel at the Bristol Myers Group Company, you'll realize that this is a pattern in her life, that she's constantly you know, pushing the boundary. Another thing that I love is that Sandy talks about having integrity and ethics as your guiding star having courage and finding your voice, uh, whether that is calling out a microaggression in a meeting or speaking up about issues like racism. So Sandy has written a really great op-ed on this topic and I'm gonna link that in the description bar below. All right, get ready to be motivated and energized by this interview. Here is Larry Tu and Sandra Leung. Sandy, it's with great pleasure and honor that I welcome you to the, the Papa Coffee House. Uh, your legal career has taken you to the highest levels of the corporate world. But on top of that, you've also given back to your community in so many ways as a longtime leader in both the Asian, but also the broader diversity bars. So we are indeed fortunate to have you on this program. I wanna start by thank you for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedule to join us today. Let me thank you, Larry, for your time and for doing these interviews for this great series. I also want to thank all of the people who thought of doing this series. And I think this is terribly exciting. So thank you very much. Well, you are most welcome. And we're, we're, we're so uh, blessed to have you. So, Sandy, you, um, you have a remarkable career. And it's it, what's outstanding about it in so many other ways, among other things, is the fact you've been with the same company for nearly 30 years. So I would like to start uh, our session today by having you tell us about your current role. Uh, what you do for the company and what the company stands for and the mission that you so closely identify with. Well, thanks so much for the question, Larry. First, I should say, yes, I've been at my company, Bristol Myers Squibb, for nearly 30 years. I have my 30th anniversary this coming August. Um, but I have to say, I feel like I've worked for five different companies during that time. And I think that's a sign of good companies. They constantly evolve and they constantly uh, adjust to uh, adjust to the times and make necessary change. I love working at Bristol Myers Squibb because we are a global biopharmaceutical company that's really focused on making medicines for patients to address unmet medical need. We're not the so-called lifestyle medicines. We make uh, medicines to treat serious diseases like oncology. Uh, we also make immunology drugs and cardiovascular drugs as, as other areas as well. Um, and what really resonates me about working for Bristol Myers Squibb is that we always put the patient at the center of everything we do. We're a very patient-centric company. And in all of our key decisions, we consider what's best for patients here. And that's very motivating and very exciting. And we're so passionate, all of us who work at Bristol Myers Squibb about the work we do every day on behalf of patients. Now, Sandy, you have been general counsel for, I think, uh, something like 15 years. Uh, yeah. but, your, but your job has expanded uh, from the beginning of that 15-year period where you've taken on additional responsibilities beyond being just the general counsel. So tell us a little bit about that. Yes, well, I, I came into this role in um, February 2007, so it's been quite a while. Um, in addition to having responsibility for you know, lawyers and other professionals that su support lawyers, I also have responsibility for compliance and ethics now, as well as employee occupational health, safety, and sustainability, uh, corporate philanthropy, and corporate security. So it's all these functions are interrelated, and it's fantastic because I love having all these functions reporting up into me because I get to meet professionals from all different types of specialty. And there's, there's opportunity for a lot of movement for people within my team to move from one function to another. So it's, it's, um, it's really uh, rewarding to have a variety of functions reporting into me. 
Now, as if that weren't enough to do uh, in a normal working day, on top of all of that, you've also been so active in the legal community. It's NAPABA, it's ALDEP, it's MCCA. Um, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. So tell us a little bit about your outside activities and how you fit all of that in. It's not easy fitting everything in, but I love what I do. And you have to continue to do things that you're passionate about. I've um, always wanted to give back to the Asian American community. Uh, you know, ever since I was in college when I was very active in Asian student organizations, I never imagined that one day I'd be general counsel of a global biopharmaceutical company and have, at, and have this big platform to uh, help the Asian American community. And so I embrace it. I enjoy it. I of course, my work is my work. I have to get my main job done, um, but I will always find time to work, whether it's all deaf or MCCA or and, and now NAPABA. It's part of who I am. It makes me feel much more fulfilled, even at, at in my main job, when I know I could also have time to work on with other organizations that, that mean so much to me. And it's also it seems to me quite wonderful that your company supports all of these other activities because clearly it takes a little bit of time away from your day job. Not that you would ever sacrifice that, but you have to accommodate and juggle and your company is supportive, which is also a great thing and speaks well of your employer. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more, Larry. My my boss, uh, our, our CEO, prioritizes diversity, equity, and inclusion, and he encourages not only me, but every member of our leadership team, and really all employees, to give back to our communities, the, the causes for which we're passionate about, because our patients live in our communities. And so mm -hmm. when we give back to our communities, we're also um, helping our patients. So... We'll come back to all of this in a, in a few minutes, but I'm gonna turn back the clock to the very beginning, not the beginning of time, but the beginning of your life. And, well, <laughs> well, that's, we're, that's we're, going back quite a ways. <laughs> and we're gonna to try to figure out how you went from there to here. So tell us a little bit about your family background, You know, your parents, how you all came to the US and your early upbringing. Well, both my parents are immigrants. Um, my father's from China and my mother's from Hong Kong. And my father actually came to the US as an undocumented alien. And that's what I guess that's the, the, the official term for it. He was a laborer on a British merchant ship when in his late teens, early 20s. And on one of his trips to New York on this British merchant ship, he literally jumped ship, didn't get back on the ship and stayed and worked in New York's um, Chinatown and the underground economy there. And, and he eventually gained citizenship through through serving for the U.S. Navy, serving in the U.S. Navy during World War II. I guess word was out in the immigrant community that there was the possibility of gaining citizenship uh, if you served for the U.S. because, of course, back then, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 was still in effect. And my mother came to the country in a similar way, my grandfather, my mother's father, also fought for the U.S. Army during World War II and eventually brought my grandmother and my mother over from, from Hong Kong uh, after the war. Um, I actually so so your up, mother didn't yes. jump aboard a ship and, no. and, 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 and carry herself halfway around the world in a stealth fashion. She 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 did not she did not but she's uh, happy to make sure that 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 me and 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 my that my um, nine siblings all know uh, the story of how my father came to this country. Um, so I I was born in Stamford, Connecticut. I'm one of ten children, and all of my siblings were either born in New York or Connecticut. I was actually born in New York. And um, people ask me about what birth order uh, I, I, I'm in, because I guess people infer a lot in, in that. And I'm the third oldest in my family. I have my parents had three daughters, a son, and then six daughters after that. So you were not the oldest one bossing the others around. You also weren't the youngest one getting picked on by all the others. You were somewhere in the middle. Well, you know, even though I, I had two <laughs> older siblings, I was the known as the assistant mommy in the house because I took care of my younger siblings, make sure they had the, did their homework, uh, had lunches the next, made their sandwiches at night so they had lunches the next day. So I was I was the responsible older sibling. And my other two sisters were, you know, doing whatever they, they were doing, but I was the one that really cared for my younger siblings. So, so this is maybe one of the early clues we have now stumbled into about your future success, right? <laughs> this, 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 this personality trait was there from day one. I, you know, I was raised with a tremendous sense of responsibility for my younger siblings, and yeah. I, I cared for, my, I loved my younger siblings and my, and, and my brother. So I was the one that was always very much in tune with what was going on with them in their lives. 
So you, your family then moved from New York to Connecticut, um, yes. and that's where you went to school. Um, and I would I would bet that back in those days there weren't that many Asian families in uh, Connecticut where you were living. That's definitely true. We're, I think we're one of the first Asian families to move to Stanford, Connecticut. And we, we came to Stanford because my uh, father, my father's uncle, I guess, started a restaurant, the first Chinese restaurant in Stanford, Connecticut. My father came uh, to work there and uh, was a waiter and eventually came to own the restaurant. So at, we were one of the first Chinese families here. And an interesting story that when we first bought our house um, in Stanford, I guess that was in 1965 after we moved from an apartment, my parents then had six children. Um, we learned after we moved in from a neighbor that a petition had been circulating in the neighborhood um, protesting our moving into the neighborhood because we were the first non-white family in the neighborhood. But the neighbor after told my mom, I still remember Mrs. Diulio said that, you know, you're actually okay. And so we, you know, we had that petition circulating, but I'm glad that we didn't, nothing came of it because you guys actually are good neighbors. So was the pe petition seeking to to take some to, action to stop the sale of the house to Chinese oh, I see. people. So oh that's gosh. that's that's what we that's what we learned. And, and so people in town eventually came to know our family, not only because my father uh, had the only Chinese restaurant then in 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 Stanford, Connecticut, but they also knew that we had lots of kids in our house uh, and, and and lots of kids in our family, and uh, and the people, the school, all the teachers knew our, our our family, and they had very high expectations for academic and and, and behavioral uh, performance in in, hmm. in the school for all of us. Did you work in the restaurant as as a child early, in, in the early days? I did not work in the restaurant as a child because my father always said the restaurant was not a place for a woman to work. Um, I did work in the restaurant, though, when my father became ill uh, when I was in college and the beginning of law school and they needed more help on the restaurant. My brother worked there, too, and my sister worked there. We just had to all pitch in uh, when my father was ill. He was diagnosed with liver cancer and, and we all had. And so we uh, ran the business for a while. And fortunately, uh, my brother continued with the business when I went off to law school. My father eventually uh, my father did pass away during my first year of law school. Yeah. But I was able to stay in law school. Now, is the restaurant still still a family business? Is it still in no, the family? No, no. My oh, okay. my 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 brother worked in the ran the restaurant for a number of years because there were many younger siblings to support through college, um, and and then eventually my my mom sold the restaurant in the uh, in the mid eighties. Now, Sandy, I understand from very good sources that you're quite an accomplished Chinese chef. <laughs> so you must have learned that somewhere, either through osmosis or actually observing. So so tell us your 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 best dishes that you cook uh, that that would make uh, your parents proud. Well, I love making dumplings, so that I think there's there's a lot of patience that go into it. So I, I make a lot of uh, Chinese dumplings, um, and I make you know just plain home cooking. I I like making mapa tofu, uh, and I'm um, I um, don't eat meat, so I I make a lot of vegetarian uh, Chinese dishes. Well, I make dumplings too, and my gripe about dumplings is that the preparation takes forever, and the consumption happens in <laughs> a nanosecond, <laughs> and then I they're know, all gone. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean, Larry. <laughs> so, on to college, which you have described to me as sort of a period of an awakening for you. So, talk about what that meant uh, in terms of your development uh, into into adulthood. Yeah, uh, I didn't have any Asian friends uh, outside of my family members growing up. It's just the community we grew up in. And when I went to college, I went to, went to Tufts. Suddenly, I had all these Asian friends. We had an, an Asian house, an Asian student club. And I finally felt like not an outsider. <laughs> and there were people who um, we had, I had a lot in common with. We ate the same sorts of foods. We had many things to talk about. And then it also awakened my political consciousness uh, too. I became very in, in I became very involved in our Asian student club and was president for, for two years. And um, we did many things with the um, Chinese community in, in Boston's Chinatown, um, many things with, with, with children there. Uh, we had many cultural events on, on campus as well. And I made so many good lifelong friends uh, during mm. my, my college years. 
I also became involved in the East Coast Asian Student Union and met many people from other colleges along the, the, the East Coast, from, from Yale, from Harvard. We also, I was at the first big ICASU conference in, the, in Princeton, uh, New Jersey. Uh, and so um, met lots of people there and, and, and still um, I'm in touch with many people that I was politically active with in Ikasu, uh, e even to this to this day. And then I have my lifelong friends from from Tufts, um, from the, the Tufts Asian Student Club, too. And our, and our children know one another, too. But it, it's it's a, it was a fantastic experience and really sort of had had this political awakening and came in touch with my my Asian American roots, so to speak. So you, 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 you said that for the first time you felt like you were not an outsider. Yeah. So did you feel like an outsider growing up in Stamford, Connecticut? Very much so. It was pretty lonely, even though I was one of 10 children, I felt it, it was, it felt lonely growing up. Um, you know, I wasn't into the partying and drinking that many of my uh, peers were in, 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 in high, in high school. Um, I, you know, didn't like to hang out and, you know, drink at the gas station like some of the other kids were doing. It just wasn't me. So I, I, I felt, um, you know, I felt I felt different. And of course, as the only Asian student uh, in many uh, in, in, in for many years, um, there was uh, besides my siblings, there was a lot of taunting and, and sense of otherness. So it was not a, I, high school was not a great experience for me. I left after three years and went to college. That's how much I did. did I, that's how much I wanted to get out of uh, high school. So you sped through it. I sped through and got out in three years and I never regretted that uh, decision because going to uh, Tufts, meeting my friends there, not only at Tufts, but in other other um, colleges, too, in the area was a, a, a wonderful experience. And I also felt like I developed leadership skills there, too. Just being um, president of an organization, organizing events, developing agendas for meetings, making sure that people at meetings felt free to speak up. Uh, and share their viewpoints and digesting viewpoints and coming up with the and making decisions of what how the organization should proceed, uh, I thought was a, a really good um, training ground for being a lawyer and for the work I do today. And it got me over my fear of public speaking too. Although it sounds like your assistant mommy role early in life <laughs> we, we had, had prepped you really for this leadership role in college. Well, so I'm not, I'm not that surprised to hear about this. <laughs> Bossing your younger siblings around versus trying to influence people where you don't have any real authority over <laughs> is, is a little different, but but it certainly helps. So then from Tufts off to law school. So, I mean, was law something that was always a career aspiration? Did you did you stumble into it? Was it an accident? Was it by default? Tell me about that decision. You know, I thought about being an attorney from a fairly young age because I felt growing up that my parents, their friends, and some of our relatives were disadvantaged, not so much because of language issues, but because they just didn't know how the system worked. And that struck me as, as a child, that they didn't know how to get things done. And so I decided that I wanted to have a job, a role, a career where I could help people speak, where I could speak for people who couldn't speak for themselves for whatever reason. And being a lawyer seemed to be um, a natural um, job to allow me to do that. Um, I also watched a lot of TV as, as a kid. That's how, I, I don't know, that's what lonely children do, even though, even though it was one of 10. Um, but I, watched Perry Mason and I felt that, you know, he really did kind of help people. He was kind of cool. He was smart and people respect him the court. And I said, I'd love to have a job like that. I also saw other shows. I don't know how many people remember the court of Eddie's father, but there was one of the oh rare, <laughs> one of the rare Asian females on, on TV was on. She was the, the, the housekeeper um, who was quiet and subservient and really was demure and didn't speak up that much. Um, and I just felt that's so not me or any of my siblings. So I not only wanted to be a lawyer, I wanted to be a litigator. I wanted to be in court because I wanted to, to, to speak up and not be the quiet, subservient uh, woman. So uh, maybe that explains your first uh, job after law school, which was uh, threw you into a role in the Manhattan DA's office, where I think you ended up trying something like 40 jury trial cases. Yeah, to verdict. Uh, yeah, and, and maybe maybe this was you know your your uh, the the impersonation of Perry Mason by, <laughs> by Sandy. 
<laughs> so tell us about that phase of your career, because that's an unusual path into a general counsel role. So I'm so interested to hear about what took you into the DA's office. Well, I knew that I was not the type of lawyer who'd want to do legal research and writing for the first few years of my life. I wanted to get in the courtroom very quickly. And going to the DA's office was a natural place to go. Um, I did criminal defense work for the Legal Aid Society one year, and I decided after that experience, I'd rather be a prosecutor um, because as a prosecutor, you have the ability to dismiss cases if you felt you couldn't prove the charges or to prosecute the case if you felt that that you could and justice required that. So I decided to work in, in the prosecutor's office. And I never regretted that decision because I learned so much at, at the DA's office that helped me in my career that I, I have right now. Uh, we were given such tremendous responsibility at a young age. I mean, you know, many of us were, I was 25 years old when I when, when I joined the DA's office and you're in court prosecuting cases, making decisions whether or not to charge a defendant or not, and really trying to do, trying to do the right thing. Um, and you learn very quickly the DA's office how to, to separate the signal from the noise. Uh, you learn how to, to summarize what's really important uh, and what your key points are in court very quickly because judges aren't very patient. And very importantly, too, um, you learn to talk to people from all walks of life. And I think that's really important as a lawyer. We had to deal with you know, crime victims, uh, defendants when you took statements, police officers, judges. And so you had to find a way to talk to people who you had very little in common with. So you had to just figure out a way to connect with people. And I think that's such an important skill as an attorney to, to help your clients. Your clients have to trust you and they have to be um, open to talking to you and you have to be an accessible person to for your clients to feel they can talk to you. And knowing your audience is something litigators always talk about. And that's a skill that is important for lawyers to have, to always know your audience. And at the DA's office, you were forced to do that very quickly to be a successful prosecutor. You really had to know what, who you were talking to in what context and what you were trying to achieve. But I love my time at the DA's office. And of course, doing the right thing all the time. And it was something that resonates with me and, and something I've carried throughout my career, holding integrity and ethics as my North Star. That's something that you know really is at the DA's office. What we emphasize uh, all the time. So I am just so fascinated by this choice because you mentioned earlier something about um, you know overcoming some stage fright or fear of public speaking, which I think many of us have. And now you're suddenly in a role where you're in front of a jury uh, and a judge. Uh, in 40 trials, you took the verdict. So that first time in front of a jury must have been terrifying. Oh, it absolutely was. And I was terrible at it. <laughs> so I, I would so draw the contrast between your first jury trial and how you how you experienced that versus your 40th, because that must have been a tremendous growth that you went through as you as you as you uh, navigated your career in the eight years in the DA's office. It's it's true. My 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 first uh, jury trial, I think, was a, something like a gambling case or something, a misdemeanor. So the stakes weren't tremendously high. But I just got stuck on questions establishing chain of custody of the you know the gambling proceeds and everything else, and I I, I was so terrible at it. There was like blood on the floor after the trial was done. And I felt so small. And I said, this is, but I was determined to get better at it. And each, each, with each trial, I gained more and more confidence. And I have to say, I only lost one felony case during, during that time. So my trial record was, was pretty good. But at the end, my last assignment was in homicide investigations. Um, and that's a unit where we investigate unsolved homicides that we tie to, to drug gangs. And so we would do the equivalent of state Rico and indictments of drug gangs, take them out and, 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 and try these cases. So I was much more confident uh, at the end. Um, and there's there's a great feeling when you know the jury's on your side, when you're yeah. when you're presenting something and and when you after during your summation, you, either nodding or and, and, and you know that. And there's a something we learn at the, at the DA's office when everyone tries to read jurors' faces when they come in, when they're deliberating and they have a question. Um, and someone told me early on that a sleeping juror is a convicting juror. So if, if you see jurors come in and they're not so concerned, you say that's that's actually a good sign. That's that's what they say. And that's actually, in my experience, proven to be true. 
Well, I have to believe I've never I've never done a trial, but I have to believe that even in your four year jury trial, there are still butterflies and there are still nerves because that's sort of Absolutely. what gets the adrenaline going. But you're just so much more confident about dealing with all that. Absolutely. Each case is so different and you can never uh, predict what a jury will do, what a witness will say. So you have to be prepared for everything. And so you're on high, high alert the, the, the whole time. But you're right. This, your adrenaline is pumping the whole time. You're on trial and you're listening intently for, for everything. Now, am I right that you are the first Asian woman lawyer in the Manhattan DA's office? Yes, I and which is ironic because um, the Manhattan DA's office is located right in the heart of Chinatown, and uh, I was hired in 1984. So it took that long wow. uh, for them to hire an Asian American um, female ADA. I think there have been like two or three Asian American men hired before me, and we all n- knew one another. I mean, I, after I joined, they 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 came back and 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 we and and, and told me you're the first uh, Asian American female hired. So it's a uh, it's been I, and you know one of the, the anecdotes that that I have is I inherited Sonia Sotomayor's um, uh, criminal uh, law books. So, so her laws is criminal procedure and all that because her name was written in, and I and I had her old alcove office at, when she was <laughs> in the same trial unit. And I actually met her. I met her once at Columbus Park in Chinatown as she was passing through, and and there was one of my colleagues that I was having uh, walking through the park with knew her. So I actually met her. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a great story. So from there into corporate America. So you know that that is a. I would say a surprising move, uh, and maybe in in your case, uh, a move driven a little bit by fortuity. So (laughs) so describe how, you know, the thinking behind why you were interested in the role, but then actually how you got it and some of the luck around that. Yeah, well, it's... um... I had been at the DA's office for eight years. And one of my friends there said, oh, there's this company in Midtown, New York named Bristol Meyer or something. I think they make, she said, I think they make soap, but they're looking for <laughs> litigators. Uh, so, and they like hiring people from the DA's office. I wasn't actively looking to leave the DA's office at that time, but my husband and I also had two small children at that time. And I was then again in the homicide investigations unit. So I was constantly trying cases. I didn't see my, my, my babies that much. So I was looking for more predictable hours, not necessarily fewer hours, but predictable hours. And so um, when this opportunity came up, I thought, what the heck, you know, I throw my resume, I submitted my resume, throw my hat in the ring. And, um, and I was called in for an interview. I met with the head of litigation. The litigation department was all white men at, at the time. But through the interview process, I learned more about the company and thought this is a place I could I could work. And and I liked what the the company did. I learned more about our pharmaceuticals business, and I uh, liked the prospect of working for a company that made products that really made a difference in people's lives. So um, I was hired into the litigation department, and I learned months later from a person of human resources that worked on this uh, role that I got in litigation that the reason why I was selected was a little bit by by accident. She said she was moving a stack of resumes and they received hundreds of resumes for this role in litigation from one credenza to another. It's back then when they still had paper resumes. And as she was moving the resume, she dropped the stack of resumes and my resume floated because I was the only one that used blue paper. So it it stood out. She picked up my resume and saw that I was a woman and I was a person of color. And she said, she said to herself, we've been trying to get the head of litigation to hire a woman. So she forced the head of litigation to meet with me. And, um, and apparently he liked me. I, he made some off color jokes, even at the inter my first interview, (laughs) which, um, which at back then this was this was the you know early 90s and I'd worked at the DA's office so it didn't phase me at all you know I, and and so I think that he the the fact that it didn't phase me because I think he was testing me a little bit um, but I have pretty thick skin um, but we yeah, by we the way I think, I think when you said that you're giving him a lot of credit but anyway he, that <laughs> <Yes>. is amazing <laughs> I'm probably giving him more credit than than he he deserves um, yeah. and. Uh, uh, but we got along. His jokes didn't bother, didn't phase me at all. Uh, but I thought it would be a challenge to to work in the place. But I was up for a challenge and up for a change. So that's how I started at Bristol Myers. 
So the blue paper was an accident. It was not premeditated on your part. Not premeditated at all. <laughs> blue is one of is my favorite color. So so from from being an entry level or a staff attorney litigator to becoming GC. So how the heck does that happen? So so tell us the steps that led to that. Yeah, you know, again, the older I get, the more I appreciate that life is so much a serendipity. Um, and I, I say that I was lucky, but as they say, luck is the intersection between hard work and opportunity. I was in the litigation department for eight years, and then I had an opportunity to become the corporate secretary. I was told by the then general counsel that the current corporate secretary was uh, going to be fired. And they wanted me to take her role, and but I had that only an hour to talk to her about what she did. I knew nothing about being a corporate secretary. Um, but I also knew that I learned the most when I don't have my sea legs and I'm outside my comfort zone. So I said, sure, I'll, 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 I'll do it. And the general counsel said, oh, by the way, it's not a promotion. It's not more money. You'll do it for a couple of years. It's rotational. And we'll see what happens after a couple of years. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll do it. But I also asked, what's my safety net? Because I have no idea what I'm doing. And he said, just talk to this Lori Cravath. He'll tell you what you need to do. And that then and, and you'll be fine. And shortly after I became corporate secretary, we had one situation after a, another disclosure issues, an SEC investigation, uh, an investigation by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Then in, in, in New Jersey, Chris Christie was the U.S. Attorney. Then we had so, two so you guys you guys were in crisis mode at that point. We and, were, and, and you were there uh, with a front seat view of the whole thing. Yes, as 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 corporate secretary, we had two financial statements in in one year. Uh, and I was the uh, attorney, the in-house attorney working with uh, outside counsel and our other advisors to get us through that, that, mm. that period. And eventually it led to a deferred prosecution agreement for two years. And I was the liaison with our, 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 our federal monitor and his staff of lawyers. There were many, many lawyers just embedded in our business during the deferred prosecution period. While we were in the midst of the deferred prosecution agreement, we had another issue where the Department of Justice Antitrust Division brought a criminal complaint against us. Uh, and to expedite the disposition of that, we pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor, paid a million dollar fine. The disposition of those matters led to the then CEO and general counsel losing the roles. And I literally received a call in the middle of the night from one of our board members asking me to be the interim general counsel. Um, and I, I wasn't the most senior person in the law department, but the board of directors knew me as corporate secretary. And so they trusted me to be general counsel, at least on an interim basis. Um, after a period of five months after a search, uh, they took interim away from my title and I became general counsel. So Sandy, this is not quite like the blue paper thing, but in a way, um... When I think back on this, you took a risk by, when you took the corporate secretarial job because it was not an, uh, a field that you were familiar with. Um, and in making that choice, you then stepped into a role that opened up this door for you. But who would have known at the time that that was going to happen, right? Although you, you took a chance on yourself and you took a risk and the risk paid off. Yeah, that's so true. And I give this advice to young lawyers all the time. You have to take risks in your career and career paths aren't always linear. Sometimes you have to take a side step or you have to take a step backward to take five steps forward. And so it's a way to look at your career. You can't look at your career as always being a linear and, and you have to have to take risks and risks don't always pay off, but, but, uh, but you have to be open to taking them. Now, when you took that role, did you leave the litigation role behind? Yes. Well, so 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 there you go. The, the thing you knew the best and had done for so many years and you were expert at, you were actually leaving behind for a role that you were stepping into for the very first time. Although it turns out, as it turned out, because of the crisis mode that you were in, that that corporate secretary role involved a lot of dealing with regulators. That's and, very and, true. And, and, and lawyers in litigation mode coming after the company. That's true. And I actually think that uh, my litigator background helped very much during that time when my company was in crisis. And it came in especially handy one, uh, one summer um, when the FBI came to our headquarters on Park Avenue with a search warrant. 
Um, and the corporate security team came straight to me because I was the only former prosecutor on the legal team in the building. And uh, so I had to deal with, with that situation. This is with the antitrust uh, review uh, that was going on, the antitrust investigation, I should say. Yeah. So so the, having that litigator background re- really did come in handy. Well, listen, I, it seems to me that luck goes, it goes in, every, in, in both directions. You, you may have had a little bit of luck uh, although you ex- you exploited the opportunities in getting to where you got, but I, I'd say the company was very lucky to have you in that spot at that time, given the crisis that they were confronting. Yeah, that's I, I that's what I'd like to think as well. And I, you know, one of the things that I'm really um, grateful for is staying with my company through that crisis period because it was really hard. Be, we were in the newspaper, and we're in the in the Wall Street Journal, and the Times for being the poster child for bad behavior and bad corporate behavior. And it was really difficult, but I was committed to being part of the change of the company. And we've had a complete change in leadership um, since that time, a complete change in culture. Uh, And that was really the important piece, a change of culture at the company. I think Lou Gerstner is credited with saying that culture eats strategy every time. And that's so important. We got through that difficult period in the early 2000s um, by making a complete culture change at the company, which required a change in leadership too. Well, you know, when when companies go through crises like that, I think the general counsel or the person sitting in that seat or next to it um, it, uh, has a huge amount of responsibility and stress. And there are there are long periods and dark days when the future is just so uncertain and the end is nowhere in sight. So you live through all of that, of course, during that period. Um, And what advice do you give people who find themselves in that spot in a company going through a very long drawn out process where there is no end in sight, yeah. you know, how to get through it and where to look to, look to for support. Yeah, I, I think it's very important to um, have your safe network of people you could count on for advice. Um, second, I would say, and probably most important, is keep an eye again on integrity and ethics as your North Star and be patient with it, but keep, keep your, your eye on that. Um, and I think that's most critical. And the other thing that's really important is to have a sense of humor about it. <laughs> because it's, when you're in these circumstances where things, just one bad thing after another is happening and you don't know who to trust and what's going on, that's when it's really important to go to your safe network, keep your eye on integrity, and you have to laugh a little bit uh, about it and find people to laugh with um, yeah. and because it, it's a way to relieve stress. Sandy, I'm going to switch topics for a minute and 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 and, and uh, throw a quote at you from something you either said or wrote, and I want to ask you to talk about that. Um, okay. You said that it's very important, even as the leader of uh, a department, like a law department in a company, to not let pride get in the way of asking for help because you don't have all the answers. So, oh, it's so true. Yeah. So tell me what you mean by that and the importance of that realization, even as the leader of an organization. Yeah, I always say that the title general counsel means you're general, you're not an expert at everything. And it's so important to surround yourself and hire people who are expert at what they do. No one, I'm rarely the smartest person in in, in the room, and I'm not afraid to say that, but I always make it a point to hire people who are expert at what, what they do, and they know what when to get me involved, when something requires my attention. Um, and um, yeah, no one has all the answers because we, as general counsel, we cover such a wide range of topics. Uh, and it, and it's surrounding yourself with experts is important. I, I kind of analogize it to when I was in high school, I ran cross country and I was not the fastest runner by any measure, but I always made it a point to run with people who are faster than me because that forced me to run faster. And I carry that same philosophy today when I I hire people on my team. And I feel now I run with the fastest. I have a fantastic legal team. And so it's it's terrific to work with such a talented, great team. Well, I mean, that kind of, you know, sort of self-awareness and even humility as a leader, did you always have that? Was that there from day one or is that acquired over time through experience, through lessons learned, through mistakes and through maturity? 
certainly from from mistakes. I, uh, I like many people um, in our roles, we're very hard on ourselves, and we dwell on, on on our mistakes. And but but making the turn from dwelling on your mistakes and being committed to learning from them are two different things. And I think I've, I've, you know, it took me a while to really make that turn and stop beating myself up and, and, and think about, okay, what am I learning from this and what am I gonna do differently next time? Uh, so I think that comes, and I think some of it is kind of cultural too. I, I grew up in, um, in a household where boasting about yourself was um, really frowned upon. Uh, and I was also, Grow, grew, I also grew up in a household that was um, pretty superstitious. And I also, so I felt that if I bragged about something I did or some accomplishment, something bad would happen to me. So I've tried, uh, I, so I think all along, I've tried to tamp down on, on bragging about myself for, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, including the way I was raised. Yeah. Although I would say that you, you probably have been very successful, no doubt in advocating for yourself, because in managing one's career, if you don't speak up, you don't get anywhere. And so you know, one has yeah. to figure out how to do that, right? That's that's such a good point, Larry. And that's something that I've certainly learned to do throughout the years. No one thinks about your career more than you do, and no one's a mind reader. So you have to advocate for yourself, say what you want. It took me a while to do that. Um, and I wish I had done it earlier in my career. But there are times where you really have to stand up and say what you want. You have to uh, articulate what opportunities you want to have in, 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 in your job, whether it's in a law firm or in a corporation, and ask what additional skills or capabilities do I need to acquire to get to that next level, get to that, that next role. So always advocate for yourself. And I love it when people on my team advocate for themselves. And I, and I, and I tell them that you should always advocate for yourself. Tell me what you want to do next, because I can't read your mind. Well, so it may not be boasting, but you had to find a way to overcome that superstition about why it may not be good to assert and advocate for yourself to actually do that. Uh, and I think that's something which all of us have had to learn too, uh, given yes. our, especially given our cultural upbringing. Yeah, so true. Uh, now, another leadership trait I want to talk about is courage. Um, and in particular, I want to uh, talk about a recent editorial that you put out uh, that spoke to issues of hate crime, uh, systemic racism. Um, it was a powerful statement, uh, so well done. Um, and even in it, you make the point that it actually took you a while to find the voice to speak like that. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because I think a lot of us struggle with dealing with these very difficult issues, especially given our own backgrounds, but finding that voice and finding yeah. the courage to speak is hard, but very important. Yeah, uh, so it's been quite a journey, but I, I have to say the summer of uh, 2020 was a, a time that all, all of us will remember Be the murder of George Floyd, um, the anti-Asian um, violence uh, arising from the reckless rhetoric from politicians about the, the, the coronavirus uh, really caused me to think about many things and, and develop the, and have the courage to, to speak in, on, on some topics. It's very hard, especially when you're early in your career, to speak up on things that, that you know are not, not right. And many of us, like I did early in my career, when I was at the DA's office, um, police officers and others would often say things about um, Blacks, about Latinos in the justice system that were just downright racist. And they viewed me, I suppose, as a safe minority. And so they felt free to say these things in front of me. And early in my career, I would I wouldn't say anything, telling myself um, a little, maybe a little delusional, a little delusional, that my silence was an indication of my dissent. But it really isn't. You know, you you encourage, you promote what you don't protest. And so, but I didn't have the courage back there to speak up because I wanted to work with police officers. I wanted to be viewed as an ADA they they that they could work with and and, and trust. Um, and I'm, when I think back at that, those times that I didn't speak up, I'm really kind of ashamed that I, that I didn't speak up, um, didn't speak up then. And I, and I, I will always carry that regret. 
Um, I, I certainly think that um, the older you become, the more experience you have, the more secure you are in your career, you feel more empowered to speak your mind. And it's really liberating when you get to that point. I feel now, and times have also uh, changed where I think uh, management teams, CEOs are much more open and encourage people uh, to speak up. But I um, I feel like sometimes the crazy ant in the room where I could just say what's on my mind and without fear of retribution. Uh, but I, I don't say crazy things, of course, but I say what's exactly on my mind. If something doesn't strike me as being right, if I feel uh, a comment was was um, um, not in, in inclusive or could could uh, had a, had was an, a, a indication of microaggression. I would, I would, I have no reservation about calling it out at a meeting uh, with a CEO there or, or anyone else. Yeah. Well, I would say, Sandy, that your statement about maybe feeling that maybe you should have done this earlier in life is another example of you being too hard on yourself. Because I, I do think people have to take the time to find their voice, and sometimes yeah. it does come with time. So um, I admire that edit, that op-ed you wrote, you wrote so uh, much, and I think it was a powerful statement. And another example of you leading. Uh, by example, and so kudos to you. Um, let me let me ask you this. Uh, we're going to wrap this up very quickly, but um, when you look back over the arc of your life, your tremendous professional accomplishments, um, your um, your community involvement, um, the, the example we just talked about a second ago about your courage in speaking on an important social and political issues, do you think that the little girl who grew up in Stanford, Connecticut? would recognize the Sandy today. Um, I mean, all of us, of course, in some respects, people say you never change and there are elements of ourselves that are always gonna be there, but you also grow and you know and develop. And so you know, what would that little girl say about the Sandy of today if she were to meet her? Um, I think a little girl would be very surprised and, and, and proud of the person I am, uh, uh, person I am today. I. Why, why, su why surprised? Why surprised? Because I had never even contemplated being a general counsel of a Fortune 200 company um, and working in the biopharmaceutical space. Um, I, it was nothing I ever dreamed or aspired to. I never asked to be general counsel. I was just kind of happy and felt privileged to work in any capacity in, in a great company. But also, as, as a child, I knew I didn't want the life my parents had. I wanted to be known for something. I wanted to make a contribution. I didn't know what that would be, you know? um, but I always felt that I wanted to do something different, something exceptional and be known for something. I didn't know that it would be um, that I would have the career I, I have now, but I'm so grateful for it. Um, and I, and I, again, I feel that I'm lucky in many ways, but I also recognize I work pretty hard for it. And I try to let, uh, and I try to leverage every opportunity that came my way. Well, Sandy, this is a, a remarkable journey you've been on and it continues. It's going to keep going. So uh, thank you for sharing your history with us and your lessons and your insights and your perspectives. Um, this has been so much fun. And, uh, you know, you and I have known, known each other for many years through yes. Napaba. Yes. And uh, it's great to see you again, even though it's virtual. And I hope to see you again soon in person. Thanks so much, Larry. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.